Thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here, and uh, uh, I'm happy to have an opportunity to tell you a bit about what we do at DeepMind. Uh, actually, as a full disclosure, um, my background is actually not in machine learning, as you may have already heard. So for the past 17 years, I've actually been building large distributed systems uh, instead. So before joining DeepMind, uh, uh, I was building file systems and very large search systems that uh, handled uh, hundreds of petabytes of data at Google. Um, and as part of that work, uh, I was also involved in uh, planning our hardware strategy for uh, search and uh, storage infrastructure. And so about a year and a half ago, uh, I joined DeepMind to lead the engineering team there because I knew that there would be a lot of uh, exciting new work uh, on the boundaries between machine learning and the infrastructure engineering. So I hope I'll be able to give you a systems infrastructure engineer's perspective on deep reinforcement learning and why it's kind of fascinating and, uh, and useful. So DeepMind was founded uh, in uh, 2010 by uh, Demis Sabis, uh, Shane Legg, and Mustafa Suleiman to solve intelligence. Um, we look at it as a sort of a Apollo program for artificial general intelligence. And uh, DeepMind is essentially a research institute within Alphabet that is now 400 plus scientists and growing. Uh, we also have a strong engineering team, actually, with about uh, 100 people. So our research setup is a little bit unique in the sense that while we have the backing and resources of a giant company, we operate completely independently, have long-term goals, and are free to focus on uh, fundamental research. Um, and uh, of course, the research is uh, into artificial intelligence. So what do we mean by intelligence? So the way we define intelligence is that it's uh, the ability to learn to perform well over a wide range of tasks and environments. So we're really interested in building general learning machines, uh, machines that can learn automatically from raw inputs and can solve a variety of tasks all without a need to reprogram them. You still need software engineers though. So. Um, one aspect of DeepMind that was quite different at the beginning, but perhaps is becoming more common now, is that uh, we take great inspiration from neuroscience. Our architectures are inspired by neuroscience research. So for example, hippocampal uh, replay uh, that's implicated in memory formation, et cetera. But we're not trying to copy the brain neuron by neuron. Um, so there's probably uh, an analogy between planes and birds here uh, somewhere. So, Intelligence doesn't uh, exist in a vacuum. <clears throat> so we develop our artificial agents in a variety of environments. And uh, games are a perfect platform to test our agents and algorithms are on. Um, there are many games out there. Uh, their complexity and visual fidelity keeps increasing. They offer a great variety of problems to solve. And of course, you know, we play games, uh, so some reasonable objective comparisons can be made about our relative performance uh, to the agents that we build. So what do we use to build our agents? It's not surprising uh, that a lot of our research centers around deep learning. Uh, what's most familiar to everyone is probably supervised learning. Given a large data set of labeled examples, it is possible to train a function approximator using a variety of clever ways to speed up uh, gradient descent. Uh, so, of course, all the, the cool kids are doing it now. And uh, given large data sets, it is indeed possible to build uh, learned functions that can achieve state-of-the-art results in domains such as image recognition, machine translation, speech recognition, speech synthesis, etc. The list goes on and on. So what about uh, when you don't have the data? What do you do then? In reinforcement learning, we look at agents, which are algorithms, uh, that are interacting with environments, for example, games, uh, and the agents perform actions like move left, right, uh, place a stone, uh, and receive observations, which could be pixels or the, the state of the world, 
and uh, uh, a reward, which could be the game score. There's usually a goal state, for example, having two bricks stacked or getting to a particular position. Uh, but the ob objective is defined as maximizing cumulative reward received from the environment over the whole lifetime of the agent. Of course, uh, the agent is some learning architecture, like, say, a neural network. Uh, note that there's no data set here. Uh, the environment generates the data in response to what the agent does. Also, while the objective is to maximize the sum of rewards, it is perfectly acceptable um, for most rewards to be zero. Uh, you only get rewarded when solving the puzzle or winning a game or reaching a certain level of performance with certain constraints, for example. There are three usual components to reinforcement learning. Um, Policy, uh, or what we call policy, is just rules of how the actions are picked. Value is literally the value of the current uh, um, state in terms of all possible future rewards, or what the agent thinks the world state is. Um, it's really how optimistic the agent is about the future, given current state of the world. Policy and value are often just deep neural networks. And finally, there is a model to transition the environment to a new state based on inputs. Um, this can just be game code, but uh, sometimes it can also be a fully differentiable model of the world. For example, if your environment is a partial differential equation. Um, don't get distracted by the math. Uh, all I wanted to illustrate is that you can choose to improve the performance of your agent by either improving uh, recursively how good any state is uh, or by nudging the policy towards producing uh, better states uh, or changing our actions iteratively by using the gradients coming from the model directly. So uh, value policy-based methods and model-based methods. This is just picking rules to update the parameters um, in either the, uh, the, the function that produces the value, the policy, or, or the model. Uh, in a way, of course, that makes the agent perform better. And we want to do this iteratively and as quickly as possible. So that's the goal in a nutshell. So what's the intuition behind it? Um, we're trying to navigate from our current state to some unknown goal state while trying to maximize reward along the way. We're trying to find a path that would reward us the most. If we could work backwards in time from our goal state, we'd just expand our horizon until we could reach the starting position. Uh, for graphs, of course, we would just use Dijkstra's algorithm. Uh, however, in this case, our states are possibly not countable. And our state transitions are stochastic. Uh, so it's not really possible to cache the estimates of the value for the, for the state space. Instead, uh, we can use deep learning to generalize and give us estimates of the value even for states we've never seen before. So it's like magical caching, if you will. Uh, however, to uh, build a good enough um, approximation, we need lots of data. And we can gather the data by exploration in the environment. So the agent can run around and explore the environment and gather data this way. Um, so in the beginning, the exploration can be random. But as our policy becomes better, we can use it to explore more interesting and uh, higher rewarding areas of the environment, or higher rewarding states, I guess. Uh, all of these ideas are actually quite familiar from dynamic programming, which comes from uh, Richard Bellman, uh, I think, from like 1954 or something like this. So, and uh, incidentally, uh, Dijkstra's algorithm is from 1959. Um, so it's not really formulated as a dynamic programming algorithm. Uh, it, it, it really uh, uh, ought to be one. So uh, uh, it's an interesting way to think about it. So the core idea is to set up recursive relationships between our estimate of how good our current state is and how good we think our future state will be given some action that provides us a reward. By setting up the problem this way, we get provable guarantees that will converge on an optimal estimate. So 
Deep reinforcement learning really brings together two powerful ideas, dynamic programming and deep learning. Uh, and uh, to train the networks for deep RL, we usually use the same tricks as we use in supervised learning. However, there are a couple of important prerequisites that must be observed. Uh, we must be able to compute a reward from the environment. Um, sometimes it's hard. What's the reward for being human? Survival, reproduction? Sometimes defining a reward is quite difficult. So that is one of the issues we have to overcome when setting up the problems for RL. And next, we must be able to execute actions in the environment to control it. Um, so the, the agent must be controllable. And uh, finally, um, uh, the, the faster the environment uh, is, the quicker we can train our agents. So, for example, training on real robots is a lot more time consuming than on games. So does this really work? So back in uh, 2014, uh, DeepMind published results showing that it was possible to learn to play Atari games solely from pixels and game score. So I just want to emphasize that there is no other inputs that goes into the uh, algorithm other than the, the, the pixels, 84 by 84 screen, and uh, or maybe it was 64 by 64, but, and, uh, and the, the score. And this was done using a variant of value-based methods, so the agent was learning how to estimate the long-term potential of what it was seeing and uh, what action it was picking. As you can see, the agent starts playing, uh, and it's quite bad, but uh, after a while it learns which states are good and, and how to avoid being killed, etc. So it gets better and better over time. Surprisingly, uh, the same algorithm works quite well on most Atari games without any modifications whatsoever. We had found a general algorithm to play uh, Atari games. To do this, um, a major technical difficulty had to be overcome. While in dynamic programming, uh, cached results are stable, right? You compute them once, they're there. In deep RL, we use neural networks, so uh, in, instead of the cache, right? And um, the networks were changing. They were learning over the course of, uh, of, of the training. And so they were changing quite a bit. So your cache states are changing quite a bit. So you're, you're, you're having a very high variance uh, in, in the outputs of the networks, which then in turn made the data produced by the agents for training uh, have very high noise, which, which hurt the training. So using inspiration from neuroscience, specifically hippocampal replay, uh, implicated in memory formation. Um, we kind of got a measure of stability by resampling some of the data from a pool of experience many times, leading to a much more stable learning. So what about harder problems? What if we never managed to find the goal state in exploration? If the reward is only given when we reach the goal, and we've never seen the goal state, then there seems to be no information that could help us decide which states are good and which ones are bad. So we definitely need to reach the goal state, and we also need to gather enough experience to generalize and make it possible to guess how good states we've never seen before really are. One way to do this would be simply to do more exploration, just scale up. So we introduced an architecture where many uh, actors run agents and uh, environments in a loop and produce experience which we store in a distributed replay table. The learners then load the data from replay in batches and train our agent's neural network to perform better. The updated network is then sent to the actors which use it to produce better actions, to explore the environment and solve the tasks, and the cycle begins anew, so you keep iterating. Of course, in practice, everything uh, runs in parallel and uh, asynchronously in the structure. 
So small digression before we go into the details of the ar architecture. So it turns out that uh, we can decompose our networks often into a policy that produces actions and a uh, critic, which takes these actions in the current state and produces an estimate of how good these actions really are. So that's really kind of the, the value given the, the state and the, and the action uh, chosen. So there are many reasons why this is very useful, but from a systems perspective, um, what's useful to know is that the critic is a lot more computationally expensive than the policy. You could think of the critic as thinking through what could be the future and modeling the, the future through the, all the deep layers of, uh, of the neural network. Um, but of course, to actually run the policy on the actors, we only need the, the, the policy network, so it's much cheaper. So, um, the actors run the policy in a loop with the environment to produce experience that gets stored as, as a sequence of transitions with state, action, and reward information in, into the replay table. Uh, periodically, new neural network parameters are sent to the actors, which update their networks and continue. To explore the environment better, we also pick some actions randomly. Uh, to fit this into the standard supervised learning framework, you could think of actors doing inference over the data they receive from the environment, and then learners actually doing supervised training. So large batches of transitions uh, are sampled in the learners from the replay table, and we can use all the machinery of supervised uh, training to fit this data with the recursive relationships between estimates of the value now and the estimates of the value at the, at the next step given a particular action. Or at least that's for value-based methods. But, uh, so while transitions in the replay table do not contain labels in a traditional sense, we have the information of what reward did we get when we moved from one state to another using a particular action. You can imagine that there could be a variety of ways we could utilize this information to learn a useful policy uh, for the agents. In terms of scale, we usually run hundreds of actors, often on CPU. And uh, the learner could be a machine with, say, eight GPUs or all the way up to a whole uh, Google TPU v, v2 uh, pod. Uh, the replay table itself is usually quite uh, a simple in-memory sharded data structure. What's interesting is that up to some limit, this setup scales almost linearly. Things that used to take months can now take hours. So here you can see a couple of examples of what can be done in such a setup. Uh, the one on the left, yeah, it's on the left. Uh, the one on the left uh, is a closed loop control of a seven degree of freedom robot trying to pick up a brick. So you notice that it keeps retrying uh, when, it, when it fails. And the, the learning algorithm only gets a reward proportional to how much it can lift the brick up the table. Uh, so you can imagine the size of the state space that, that it has to explore. And, and on the right uh, is a simple walker that is trying to uh, maximize its velocity and get to the end without falling off the track. In terms of uh, state space size that needs to be explored, both of these problems are actually uh, bigger than chess and go, but Turns out they're easier to generalize over, so they can be solved with just uh, tens of machines in kind of uh, from hours to days, depending on how you set things up. One surprising consequence of such architecture is that we end up using a lot more researchers on the actors, which just do inference and do the exploration, uh, than on the learners, which do the kind of the more traditional stochastic gradient descent on expensive uh, and fancy hardware. So this situation is similar in a way to a vanilla supervised training where the cost of actually gathering the data is much higher than doing the training on it. Uh, but many people find it surprising. 
how could it be that we're spending a lot of our resources on cheap inference, even uh, on CPUs, and not expensive accelerators? Well, one reason is that our environments can be actually quite expensive. Games have not really been set up to run in uh, batches using small resolution on expensive GPUs. Neither the game engines nor vendor drivers have support for rendering many game streams in, uh, in batch in a loop with uh, kind of doing inference on the output from the same game, uh, perhaps doing it on the same GPU even. I think uh, actually this will be an interesting area to explore for uh, system architects in the next couple of years. So if we assume uh, maybe 10,000 FPS for a very tiny per, per GPU for a 84 by 84 resolution game, uh, one GPU can produce roughly 15 terabytes of data per day. So this means that we need roughly equal number of rendering GPUs to keep up with, uh, with the eight uh, GPU learning machines. However, just keeping up is usually not enough, as we often would like to explore the environment faster and then be able to pick out the most interesting transitions, the most useful transitions from the replay table when learning. So a ratio of two to three or more of resources in favor of the actors would be actually quite normal. So actually a small digression about scaling. Uh, of course, uh, for us as uh, systems and infrastructure engineers, scaling is really exciting. I, I get very excited about it. Uh, but for researchers, what's more important is actually the overall speed of experimentation. Scaling up from one core to using one big machine is five orders of magnitude uh, of performance scaling. And uh, the software frameworks such as TensorFlow uh, are actually quite good at abstracting away most of the issues at that level. However, it is still quite difficult to run large distributed jobs. Is that extra three orders of magnitude scaling worth it? We have found that it's only worth it for a couple of large scale projects with dedicated engineering teams. Um, as there's always something special uh, that the framework does not take care of. And of course, sometimes it's worth the effort for more mature research projects that have done the exploration and now would like to invest in scaling up. One of the big projects we had, of course, was AlphaGo and AlphaZero. As you know, with AlphaZero, we can use one algorithm to learn to play a variety of games at superhuman level. The main features of AlphaZero are that it uses no human knowledge to bootstrap. It does not use any engineered features of the state of the game. It just uses a single deep neural network that produces both the policy and the value estimates and most fundamentally, um, it's combined with uh, Monte Carlo tree search uh, um, uh, together with, with the reinforcement learning and deep learning. I should point out that the algorithm works as described on fully observable problems. So we can see the state of the board fully, nothing is hidden. Um, it is also cheap to evaluate the rewards you know when you win or when there's a draw or if there's a loss. And, it, and it's also cheap to take actions in the environment. So in Go, it's just placing a bit in, uh, in 19 by 19 uh, array. Um, and of course, at the end of each game, there's an actual outcome as opposed to, say, the, the robot arm that we saw trying to pick up a brick and never succeeding at all and not knowing why. So in each position, the Monte Carlo tree search is executed. So you, you, you go through the sequence of moves by the opposing players. And it's guided by the current, current uh, neural network, the current policy, if you will. Uh, and a move is selected and, and played, and the next move is selected by the opponent, etc. And finally, uh, the game is scored to determine the winner. The policy part of the network is updated to predict the move played by AlphaGo itself in each position. 
And we want the raw neural network to directly predict the action that was chosen by the search. So the search is doing many actions while we're actually picking one action out of it. The value part of the network is updated to predict the winner of the self-play game. So that's the, the long-term prediction of how good the current board state is or how good the current state plus an action is. The new network becomes an even stronger player that generates even higher quality data next. And this process is iterated over and over again during training. So what's important to take away here is that instead of the actors running the policy in a loop with the environment uh, to generate the, the transitions that would go into the replay table to learn from, we do an explicit search in the state space by taking a sequence of actions and environment steps uh, and pruning those branches in the search tree that are no longer good. Then the final one-step transition is chosen based on what our search found. It is easy to believe that using search in this way, uh, it leads to choosing better actions than just using the policy to produce an action once. So running the policy in the search, doing it many times is probably better than doing it once. Clearly, then this will lead to better data being generated by the actors and thus better and stronger policies being learned from this data, which then feeds back into generating even better moves through search in a kind of a virtuous cycle that goes on and on and on. So in this way, Alpha Zero becomes its own teacher. And this is why such great results uh, are achieved actually so quickly. Um, Though, of course, it does help to have a very large amount of resources available to throw at the problem. Actually, I'd like to pause here for a moment and reflect on the fact that the core of these ideas for creating a virtuous cycle uh, in optimization are not new and actually go back to probably at least Richard Bellman's theory of dynamic programming uh, from uh, 1954. If you know dynamic programming, you basically understand most of what was achieved here. Of course, we now have very powerful function approximators in the form of deep learning that make a lot of these uh, problems tractable by reducing the effective size of the search space. But I just want to emphasize again that Alpha Zero is a natural evolution in the long history of uh, dynamic programming with lots of new innovation, but you can see the you can see the roots of where it's coming from. So talking about the super fast computers, uh, what's the spread between the amount of time we spend on search and on learning in Alpha Zero? Well, it turns out search is expensive. We had spent over 100 times more operations on doing the search for policy improvement uh, than on the learning itself. So we use the new Google uh, version 2 TPUs for training, which are, which are great. But to scale search, we use the, the old uh, version 1 TPUs, which are very power efficient and, and cheap. Uh, the way I like to think of this is that we spend a huge amount of resources um, thinking through our moves in TPU v1 before we decide to act on them and learn from that experience. So I think we do something similar in our heads, right? We, we think through what do we want to do and then we actually do it and we learn from it. So search is usually not as expensive as you think because it's just inference, which is maybe three, four times cheaper than training in terms of raw flops. I don't think we're alone in thinking that for inference, it is possible to use much cheaper hardware than uh, for training. Besides uh, the list on the screen, um, there's also kind of a long list of tricks that we can apply to make uh, our uh, models run faster, such as pruning, for example. Uh, the one difference from, uh, say, a fast neural network chip for inference in your phone is that the hardware uh, for search does not really need to optimize for batch size one. 
So doing search in, in batches, uh, doing search in batches is actually perfectly fine. And so that's exactly what we did on TPU v1 to squeeze kind of the maximum performance out of it as it was a matrix machine. So I do think that there are some interesting opportunities, again, for systems designers and infrastructure engineers here. We have barely scratched the surface of what the right hardware and software stacks should be for this kind of uh, use case. So to recap, for deep reinforcement learning at scale, we have been using three kinds of key accelerator hardware. Training benefits from processing large batches of data, inference benefits from lean hardware architectures to have just enough cache to keep the, the like very pruned model in memory and do reduced pre precision uh, computations. And of course, for environments, we need uh, rendering hardware. Once again, I will say that we have barely started looking at the whole uh, hardware and software stack here. So there's uh, many very interesting opportunities uh, for work in this space. What about the uh, software? If you remember my comment about scaling for research, what actually matters is how quickly new ideas can be tried out, not how far we can scale them. Scaling is still very much a uh, bespoke operation. At DeepMind, we need to find a delicate balance between how much engineering, uh, engineering time we spend on making simple experiments work and uh, how much time we spend on scaling some of the larger projects. The distribution in terms of size versus researchers is heavily skewed towards the tail, but of course, uh, uh, the large projects eat up most of the compute resources. So TPU v1 was actually quite difficult to program. So not many neural network architectures got ported to it. Um, but uh, TPU v2 uh, has a much more mature software stack, including TensorFlow and uh, XLA the, um, libraries. So it's been uh, actually a lot easier to use it. But I will say in my experience, uh, we often underestimate how much work it really is to make new hardware platform usable. Uh, as we push our research, we have found that no off-the-shelf solutions really work for us. So at DeepMind, we have a sizable team of people with backgrounds in distributed systems, compilers, performance optimization, etc., who have built any missing infrastructure that our researchers have needed. Looking a little bit uh, into the future, I actually uh, project that the total cost of ownership, including power, of just kind of the raw silicon bits uh, for a teraflop of neural network compute for inference, I should be, I should be clear here, uh, it will, will drop to probably less than a dollar by 2020. For reference, the prices today are probably around uh, $100 or something like that. Um, at these prices and the variety of use cases neural networks have, we are likely to see an explosion of type, uh, location, and uh, uses of neural network hardware. So phones, cameras, laptops, uh, laptops um, of course, anything that moves, anything that flies, etc., IoT devices, and really coprocessors in, in all shapes. Excuse me. So my guess is that we'll see these architectures in so many places. We'll either think of them as we used to think of floating point coprocessors, or they will be very much repeating that story of integration. So yeah, what about software? How are we going to program all these devices? Uh, our CUDA and OpenCL tomorrow's x86 and, uh, and RISC. Today, we program all our accelerators fairly explicitly, and uh, a lot of work goes into manual optimization. But uh, I really hope uh, we'll end up being actually able to abstract most of this away. Though, you know, I have learned the hard way not to uh, trust in compiling magic quite yet. Um, a lot of hard work will be required. So what about using deep learning NRL in problems we encounter when building systems? Um, 
So far, most of the examples have to do with recognizing cats and playing games, so maybe uh, they don't sound very serious, right? Uh, will, uh, will the time never come? I, I suppose it's instructive to try to look at the past uh, of what has happened to programming via training to try maybe to draw some conclusions for, for our own field. So in 2010, or before 2010, I should say, speech recognition was uh, very feature-based, right? We went from audio to an acoustic model, to a phonetic model, to a language model, and uh, then we produced text. And then there was a, a deep learning solution to that end-to-end. In 2012, uh, I suppose a similar uh, process uh, happened to computer vision. Again, we went from hand-engineered features, heuristics, uh, code that had been developed over many decades to end-to-end -end, uh, deep net. In 2014, the same, I think, happened to machine learning, uh, machine translation. Um, Again, there was a lot of uh, features, there was a lot of hand engineering, even as part of the statistical machine translation movement. And it was replaced by an end-to-end -end network. And then perhaps in 2017 for, for games, there was also, uh, particularly in, uh, in chess, there was a history of probably 40 years of uh, feature engineering. And uh, yeah, there was a deep learning plus RL solution. So will infrastructure be next? Where in common systems areas can we use neural networks or programming by training? There have been some successes last year. My bet is that any area where we've used heuristics and kind of classical optimization, uh, I'd say maybe compilers, scheduling, layout, routing, et cetera, we'll see better solutions developed using data-driven methods. I'm actually very optimistic about this, uh, about us being able to do this, because almost all systems, uh, systems problems have two elements that help us apply machine learning-based techniques. One, the problems are iterative or repeated in nature, and so produce actually a lot of examples. Uh, there might be skewed distributions there, but that's, a, that's a, maybe a difficulty to overcome. Uh, and the reason for this, of course, is that if it's a useful program, it's probably called many times. Two, the problems have a control element. So in other words, there's some action that is taken based on the decision which uh, allows us to throw uh, the, the data-driven algorithms at it that will learn to explore the space. So if it's just labeled examples, you, you never learn to explore the space. But if you actually get the ability to control, you can do some exploration and learn better, um, better solutions to your problems. Finally, I'd like to leave you with uh, perhaps three predictions. One, I think uh, that we will see great success applying deep reinforcement learning to infrastructure and general software problems, top to bottom, from low-level hardware to maybe UIs in the future. Um, I also think that uh, the use of neural network hardware will become just as commonplace as floating point or vector instructions are today. And then uh, finally, I believe we will need to embark on figuring out how to seamlessly integrate our usual software and hardware engineering practice with programming by training and optimization. Um, and I hope uh, you're all excited about this future as I am, um, because there's lots of very interesting problems to solve uh, here for engineers. Thank you. <laughs>